Girl, it's the nerve of me to tuck these little these little locks behind my ear, girl, like I really got some hair going on. I do a little bit. They getting long, you see it. And if you don't, you a hater. What is up, my YouTube family? Welcome back to my channel. At this point, it's giving welcome back to me, okay? Y'all, pray for the people in Houston, okay? Hurricane Barrel came through and she did not play with us. First of all, Garden Girlies, I have a vlog that I just have to edit and it's gonna still go up, but this literally, it like ends the day before Beryl came through. She has completely like torn my garden up. <laughs> it's so sad to think about, but I still consider myself one of the lucky ones. I was only without power for three days, which when the weather is consistently close to 100 degrees, that's, that's a long time. But there are people that have been without power the entire week and it is not expected to be restored until this coming Friday, which is the 19th, which will make like two weeks. This thing did a number on Houston for sure. And I know it's people like, oh, we don't care. You guys should have generators, girl. Okay, maybe so, but we still deserve empathy. Also, while I'm letting y'all know the shambles that my life is in currently, look at my finger the band-aid look crazy it does but i promise you it's clean i almost cut my finger clean off with these very sharp shears while cutting back one of my plants child i'm just i'm just going through it oh my goodness i think there are the latest update is like there are 175,000 homes still without power or different places because businesses are also being affected it's been a mess like we have not been able to get ice nowhere y'all know anytime any kind of disaster happens everybody buys up all the water instantly the few gas stations that have power the lines y'all were so insane like luckily for me i just gotten gas so I was able to use my Jeep to like escape the heat for a little bit, get in some AC, charge up my phone, things like that. But you know what really grinds my gears? I look up a hotel in the area, 365, it was either 325 or 365 per night was the going rate for a room at the Hampton Inn, mind you. That is completely outrageous. Now, not only had I just gotten gas, I had also just went grocery shopping. So I lost all of my freezer foods, all of my cold foods in the fridge all the babies lunch because you know i make their food so that was a struggle to figure out on a daily basis it was just a lot so y'all keep houstonians in your prayers but that is all i got as far as that um today's video is kind of a continuation of the last video i uploaded about guys who have these torture chambers i was gonna include his story with theirs but the video just would have been way too long for me not for y'all i know how y'all get down so instead of lumping him in with them i decided to just do like a part two so today we will be discussing the case of robert ben rhodes in his torture chamber on wheels so on april 2nd of 1990 a state trooper spots this 18 wheeler on the side of the road actually he was pulled over on the highway with his hazard lights on there are no flat tires at least not any that he can see or any other obvious signs of distress but he still assumes that the driver may need some sort of assistance so he goes up to the truck just to check officer miller approaches the truck with a flashlight and he's walking around and you know just checking out all of the things and he hears some commotion going on inside as he is walking alongside the trailer he can hear the muffled screams of a woman coming from inside of the truck he peeks into the cab expecting to see the driver but instead what he sees is a young woman that is handcuffed gagged with a horse bit and her hands are actually handcuffed to like the ceiling of the truck the woman is naked, she is disheveled, she is obviously terrified. And when her eyes meet the officer, she begins to scream even more. And at that moment, he notices that the woman is not inside of the cab alone because a man who he assumes is the driver emerges and attempts to quiet her down. The man does as he is asked. He gets out of the truck to speak with Officer Miller and he also informs the officer that he is armed, but not in a threatening way. More like a, just so you know, I got the thing on me okay and the man also insists that 
despite how it looks this is a consensual affair going on between two adults so it's really nothing to see here the woman that is inside of the truck is a 27 year old woman her real name has been protected but we'll call her katie and the man is 45 year old robert ben rhodes robert was born november 22nd that has nothing to do with a scorpio's he's outside of the scorpio dates of 1945 he is a Sagittarius okay he is from Council Bluffs Iowa and he has spent most of his adolescence growing up with just his mother his parents were married but his father was in the military so he was often overseas deployed somewhere performing his military duties now it seems that there have always been two sides to robert like a coin on one hand he performs well in school participates in athletics he's very social and excels at mostly everything that he puts his mind to and on the other hand he cannot stay out of trouble with the law even from an early age it begins with my offenses like tampering with the vehicle i'm not sure what the details of that are but there is a record of his arrest and it is not the only time that he is arrested while in high school he catches a second charge for public fighting just a thug which uh his father takes the cake okay when robert is just 19 years old his father gets himself in extremely hot water when he is accused of molesting a 12 year old girl his father denied the accusations but instead of going to court and defending himself he opts to take his own life leaving everybody to assume that that alone was an admission of guilt later that same year robert leaves his hometown to follow in the footsteps of his father and enlists as a marine but three years into his enlistment he is dishonorably discharged when he is caught red-handed committing a robbery but instead of returning to his hometown he decides to settle right here in houston where he spends the next couple of years bouncing from one dead-end job to the next while in houston you know because we got we got the fine women out here okay we got the ladies he meets a woman falls in love and the two get married he and his wife then have a son child just expanding his little trifling bloodline now like i mentioned he was hopping from one not so great job to the next he really struggles to find a job that would provide him the income he was looking for enough you know to take care of his family and be a provider partly or mostly due to his criminal background this marriage does not last long and it is not long before Robert here is on to the next relationship, which also escalates to marriage and very quickly ends in divorce. By 1987, he is 42 years old, twice divorced, but he has not given up on love, unfortunately. What he has given up on though is finding him a nice normal nine to five job that will pay him enough. When he finds out his earning potential as a truck driver, he wastes no time going out to get his CDL. He then marries a third wife, Deborah, and this is where we get a little bit of insight into the type of husband that he was and probably why his two previous marriages dissolved so quickly. According to her, Robert is mentally, verbally, and sexually abusive, and she is married to Robert for just two years before she cannot take any more and she was ready to sign the papers okay and those were the contributing factors that she listed as the cause of their divide robert was a freaky boy and that is no shade to the girls and guys with the kinks okay he admits to being a settled masochist he enjoys dominating his partners and administering punishments but not in a normal sense it is far more than just a kink says Deborah about the painful perversions that he had her participating in and what she didn't know is that with he had her do was just the tip of the iceberg of what he was really into what she doesn't know is that Robert uses his truck and his time away on the road to satisfy his darkest of fantasies and not with willing participants okay he is kidnapping torturing assaulting and killing women and he is using his truck as a traveling torture chamber the things that he had deborah do 
and what he did to her were nothing compared to what he did to these women and deborah has no idea robert has this small suitcase that he packs every time he gets ready to go onto the road but it is not toiletries and spare clothing it's restraints gags and other tools of torture like alligator clips fish hooks leashes long needles like the kind that you use for piercing adult toys whips pins collars handcuffs it was a lot in that little bag and he also has a pair of handcuffs that are always hanging from the top of the cab of his truck. In January of 1990, he spots 23-year-old Patricia and her husband, 27-year-old Douglas, hitchhiking right outside of El Paso, Texas. The two of them are traveling from Washington State to Georgia, and they are headed to attend a religious workshop. They are Christians. Their plan was to travel down, spreading the word on their way, have a good Christian time down in Georgia with their people and do the same on their way back home. Their parents, both of their parents were very concerned about this, but they felt like hitchhiking together as opposed to being solo was a lot safer. Unfortunately, they were wrong. Robert here spots them, pulls over, flashes them a very warm and welcoming smile and offers them a ride. Now, nothing about him alarms them, so they accept the ride and they hop in. They settle into the cab. Everything seems pretty normal until about a mile into the ride. At this point, Robert's demeanor completely shifts. He drops the friendly act and without warning, fatally shoots Douglas. He discards him in Sutton County, Texas. And unfortunately, Douglas's remains are not identified for another two years. At the point in which he gets rid of Douglas, he places restraints on Patricia, who is doing her best to fight him off, unfortunately to no avail. And for over a week, he holds Patricia captive, acting out his very sick fantasies. After he has done everything that he wants to do to her and has grown tired of having her around, he does the same thing to her that he had done to her husband. And she is left somewhere in Utah because mind you he's a truck driver that is on the road. Nine months later on October 26 hunters stumble across the remains and alert the police. Now unfortunately with no open missing persons cases in the area matching her description she is unable to be identified and her DNA is held in evidence until 2003 13 years later when DNA technology has advanced enough to confirm her identity. Her husband was able to be identified two years after his attack and was buried by his family. And at the time that Patricia is identified, she is sent back home to her family for a proper burial and is placed alongside her husband, which is very sad. Now, because Robert was on the move, he had figured it would be difficult for police to pinpoint like this crime to him. He was not from Utah. He was not from Washington. He was just passing through with, of course, no sort of ties to either of the victims but just in case you know just in case they were able to figure something out he had decided to lay low for a couple of weeks before he went out to claim his next victim a couple weeks later at a houston truck stop he sits and spends his time watching this 18 year old woman by the name of shauna holtz when he finally decides to approach her he of course puts on that fake friendly facade of his presenting himself as this super friendly stranger he lures her to his truck with the promise of a ride but instead of hitting the highway he pulls over into a wooded area and takes out a hunting knife he then instructs shana to get into the cab of his truck obviously it is apparent to her at this point that her life is at stake. So she begins to beg and plead with him to let her go. She tells him that if he does, she won't alert the police, she won't report him. She'll keep her mouth closed and just go on about her business as if nothing had happened. And to her surprise, it appears to work because he looks at her and he says one word, run. Shanna wastes no time. She immediately hops out of the truck, takes off into the woods, not completely convinced that he was gonna allow her to flee without attempting to run her down and chase her. But mama makes a run for it anyway, just in case. She finds a spot in the woods to hide and she hides there until she hears the truck start up again and drive off. And she still waits a little bit longer just to be sure. Afterwards, she heads back down to the main road and hitchhikes south. As promised, 
she does not alert the police she doesn't report the incident not yet at least and in the meantime robert continues his spree days later he spots yet another young couple hitchhiking 14 year old regina walters and her 18 year old boyfriend ricky jones have decided to run away from home and just like the first couple they cross paths with robert who flashes them a friendly smile and offers them a ride again he immediately gets rid of the male because he has no use for him this time he had pulled the truck over next to a wooded area had marched ricky into the woods returns to the truck without him and essays regina afterward he ties her up and they get back on the road the weeks that follow are a complete nightmare for regina he chops off her hair and torments her in literally any way that he can think of including piercing her with fish hooks he also shaved all of her hair down there as well he makes several stops in these remote areas where he would force her to dress up he would provide her dresses and heels and force her to model for him while he takes pictures and pretends he is a photographer giving her direction here's one of the photos taken of her too actually and if that is not deranged enough on march 17th regina's father receives a phone call and it is Robert calling from a payphone. He taunts the father telling him that he is aware of Regina's location while refusing to reveal what the location is and when her father asks if she is alive or not Robert ends the call without giving him an answer. Robert later makes two more calls to her parents this time speaking with the mother. He tells the mom that he wants to update her on her daughter's whereabouts but he wants to do so in person. He refuses to identify himself but she agrees to meet with him anyway and he does not show up to the location instead he keeps regina using her for his pleasure taunting her family for his pleasure for over a month before he becomes bored with her and decides to strangle her with bailing wire and he does so with so much force that he nearly takes her head off and this is believed to have happened either right at the time that he began making the calls or very shortly after her remains are discovered nearly a month later inside of an abandoned barn near greenville Illinois. At the time that she had gone missing and even after she was discovered, police believed that Ricky was responsible for her disappearance and had done this to her and he's now on the run hiding from police. This is what they believed. He is not discovered until the following year, but even then he's listed as a John Doe since they are unable to identify him, which takes another 18 years to do. So all this time he was the victim himself, but believed to have been the perpetrator. And I'm sure even after the fact, they probably believed that he had eventually taken his own life, afraid that, you know, the police would catch up with him, which is not like too crazy of an idea. It's just not what happened. After discarding Regina, Robert heads toward Arizona and in a matter of days he has his next victim, 27 year old Katie who we started the video talking about. Robert has spotted Katie at Rip Griffin's truck stop just north of Phoenix and she was there to catch a ride. She was hitchhiking to see a friend. He used his usual tactic. He approached her striking up a conversation, pretending to be very interested in her journey. Super friendly harmless none of the things that he is and he tells her that he is more than happy to give her a lift almost as soon as she had hopped in his truck she had fallen asleep but she is awakened shortly after the, the sound of the truck stopping as soon as she wakes up robert grabs her and pushes her into the cab of the truck she is fighting him back but he is a lot stronger than her so he manages to get cuffs on her both her hands and her feet he takes out his suitcase with all of his devices tells her that his name is whips and chains and that he's been 
been doing this to women for 15 years now. He viciously whips her chest and her back. He essays her and pierces both her boobs and her labia. Now, the day that Officer Miller spots him pulled over on the highway with his hazards on is the same day that he'd actually picked her up and he had spent hours torturing her before pulling over and putting those hazard lights on. And when he saw Officer Miller approaching the truck, he knew that pulling over was a terrible mistake. He is still gonna try his best to wiggle his way out of this. After identifying himself to Officer Miller, let him know he had, you know, a little weapon on him and telling him that this was consensual, he tells the officer that this woman is, quote, not playing with a full deck that she is a little, a little slow, a little out of her mind. So whatever comes out of her mouth, you really, you really can't believe it because mama ain't there. But Officer Miller has a feeling that that is a lie. So he places cuffs on Robert and puts him in the back seat of his patrol car while he talks to Katie. Now Robert got handcuffs on behind his back and he is also seat belted but apparently he has the spirit of Houdini upon him. The officer returns to the truck. He speaks with the woman who is so afraid. Like when I tell you this woman was hysterical, like she, even though the officer was there, he had the truck driver detained. She just still was not confident that she was about to be saved. It is not until the officer returns to the truck to speak with the woman that he can really see the condition that she is in. There are welts all over her chest and her back. There are cuts on her mouth. There's a horse headgear. I forgot what it's called. Is it brittle, bridle? Horse headgear is on her head and strapped around her neck. It is cutting into the sides of her mouth. It's so tight. There's also a chain connected to it that is padlocked to the truck and her hands and feet are also cuffed. Seeing all of this, the officer immediately calls for the paramedics and for backup. He covers the woman up. He is attempting to calm her down and assure her that she is now safe. But still, she is terrified that Robert is going to return. And she is not wrong. While the officer has been distracted, talking with her, calling for backup, reporting all of the things back to his superiors, Robert has managed to get his hands all the way down to his feet, bringing them underneath so that the cuffs are now in front of him, which allows him to then get the seatbelt undone. And just as Officer Miller is realizing this, the backup pulls up. They find in his pocket the keys for the cuffs that are on Katie, so they're able to get her out of that. And at this this point both of them are taken down to the police station which was kind of strange to me because why y'all ain't take my girl to the hospital first strange photos are taken of her injuries and she while being videotaped sits down with police and goes over the entire ordeal from the moment he had approached her at the truck stop to the moment that the officer walked up and afterwards she is given medical attention so they didn't just you know save her and send her home and at the point in which they start robert's interview they have already gone through the truck and found all of his tools plenty of evidence that support Katie's version of events. They also find plenty of photos of Patricia and Regina, neither of whom had been discovered and identified yet. So at this point, they still have no clue the full extent of his crimes. They think that he just picked up and kidnapped this one lady and did what he did to her. When they sit him down in the interview room in front of a camera, he sits down on the couch, stretches out and yawns as if he has not a care in the world. When they ask him about Katie, he asks them if they are familiar with the term lot lizard and explains to them what a lot lizard is how women hang around truck stops selling themselves and says that this is what katie was maintaining that this was a consensual affair just one he had to pay for and then he tries to sell the narrative that he was the victim here that he was this unlucky driver that had picked up a crazy woman and like all of this was just in her head when asked to explain the woman's injuries he says i took you up to the the point where I stopped the truck. Now I'm not gonna cross that line. I stopped the truck. I guess he couldn't figure out an explanation for th for that. That would sound plausible. So he just decided not to say more, which was his way of telling them, "Look, I've told you all I'm gonna tell you." So he just decided not to say anything else, and he has the right 
to stop talking at any point that he wants to. At this point, he has nothing else he wants to say to the officers. They photograph Robert's injuries as well because he also has them. He has defensive wounds on his arms from the women scratching him. He also has a bite wound that is on his side. And while they're taking pictures of his injuries, he asks them whether or not a lawyer, if he had one present, would approve of them taking photos of him. They take the photos and they go. They leave him alone in the room, but the camera is still rolling so they can see what he is doing. As soon as they leave out, he takes a long drag on a cigarette they had given him and he winces as he like touches his side where the bite mark is. Cause mama bit them ribs on him like it was the 4th of July. She was trying to get away. He is booked for aggravated assault essay and unlawful imprisonment. And this particular police department, they decide to make a call down to the Houston Police Department to see if he had anything pending there because that's where he lived. And at that point, they find out that a similar kidnapping had happened in Houston. He had previously abducted an 18 year old woman and held her for two weeks. During that time period, he had cut her hair really short. He had shaved her pubic hair. He'd also put a collar on her and walked her around in the woods like a dog. He gave her different piercings and told her outright that she would not be surviving this ordeal. He just didn't know at what point he was going to get rid of her, but he made it very clear that it would be whenever he had gotten tired of her. However, one evening, Robert had forgotten to close the handcuff that was supposed to secure her to the truck. She notices this, but she waits for the opportunity for her to make a run for it without him, you know, tracing her. And as soon as that opportunity presents itself, mama makes a run for it. She had gone to the police, unlike the first woman that he had let go. And they had actually detained Robert. But when they brought her in to see him to confirm whether or not he was the guy that had done this to her, she had told them no. So at that point, they were forced to release him and now that they have him locked up again they reach out to her again and at this point she admits to them that he was her attacker but she was just too afraid to say yes because she feared that he would come back for her that the police could not protect her from him and so the first time around she felt like it was in her best interest to lie now get this the detective that interviewed him wanted to take a peek inside of his apartment but he is currently waiting on the approval of his search warrant request meanwhile a woman claiming to be Robert's wife shows up at his apartment's leasing office to speak with the manager telling her she needs access to Robert's apartment. According to her, he has instructed her to come by the apartment and have everything cleared out of it. This sparks the curiosity of the apartment manager. She knows he like I am, okay? She thinks to herself like, what's in there? That he wants everything cleared out all of a sudden. So she decides to enter his apartment and take a look for herself. Inside of the apartment, she finds photos of Regina at various stages of distress, her hair at different lengths, which makes it very obvious that she has spent quite some time with him. There was also handcuffs, a lot of bondage magazines, women's clothing spread all over the place. And when the apartment manager relays this info back to the detective, the search warrant is granted. April 6th, agents swarm his apartment and they also make attempts to track down this wife. In addition to what the apartment manager had taken note of, they find women's makeup, towels saturated with blood, and a stash of white towels. Now, both women that have survived him at this point have mentioned him laying down a white towel for them to lay on top of while he essays them. Robert's trial for Regina Walters does not begin until 1994. Meanwhile, he has been locked up this whole time. And his trial takes place in Illinois. He is found guilty of first degree murder and dubbed the truck stop killer by the media. At the conclusion of this trial, he is sentenced to life in prison without the possibility of parole. He is sent away to a maximum security prison. And while incarcerated, he brags about the murders of Patricia and Douglas, the other couple, which lands him right back in court. In 2005, he is extradited to Utah to face those trials. Charges. Robert is presented a plea deal at this point because he is facing the death penalty there. He doesn't want that and they really don't want to spend the time and the money on the trial. So in exchange for him just pleading guilty, he receives an additional life sentence instead of being sent to that chair. 
or poke with the needle. Now, according to the district attorney in this case, when Robert walked into the courtroom, the energy inside the room just became really heavy and you could just feel the presence of evil is what they said. He said it made the hairs on his arm stand up. Other officers have made similar claims about the time that they spent speaking with Robert, that he was just evil and you could feel it. Like it just radiated off of him. Robert is believed to have over 50 victims in all. They believe that he was active between 1975 to 1990 when he was actually caught. But because most of his victims were either sex workers or hitchhikers, it is difficult to confirm exactly who and how many people that he has gotten his hands on. They did attempt to identify more victims of his. They got a hold of his truck logs and cross reference them with records of young women who have been reported missing within that 15 year span and the possibilities are endless unfortunately though without him confessing or them finding evidence that ties him directly to them it's really impossible to know exactly how many lives this man has ruined but the FBI's theory is that this man killed on average three women a month for the entire 15 year span and that would be 540 women not to mention their partners when he would pick up too because he, he apparently liked to do that a lot. Now his most recent wife Deborah, she spoke with police after the fact. She said she had no clue that he was up to any of this and she was completely shocked when everything came out. She also said that she felt guilty for participating in the the fantasies that she did because she felt like it kind of encouraged his perverse behavior. But girl his daddy was a pervert that was just in him it was not your fault fast forward to 2015 a photo of a young woman taken by robert is shared on facebook by several law enforcement agencies in an attempt to identify her they believe her to also be a victim of his they don't know if she's living or not but they're hopeful that somebody who knows who this woman is comes forward right to at least give them a starting point but the woman herself pamela milligan actually is the person that comes forward and she tells police that she had been hitchhiking back in 1985 when she was picked up by Robert. She says that as soon as she had gotten into his truck, he had taken this photo of her and this is the picture here and when she asked him like why are you taking this picture of me that's weird he told her that he kept a photo of all of his passengers just in case he needed to speak with the police about them later because people are dangerous and one of them could easily rob him and run away but if he has this photo of them he has a picture to show the authorities he had then after explaining this pointed to a sign on his dashboard that said cash grass or ass no one rides for free now she admits that she did not have any money she was also drug free and so she knew which of the three that it would be so while it meant that it was not her her proudest fondest memory or moment she gave him what she had on hand because she had somewhere to be she was trying to get there she says that it was 100 percent consensual the, the two of them rode for a while before he dropped her off in winnipeg missouri and went on to complete his route and i mean she had nothing but good things to say about him he had not tried to attack her or violate her in any way unfortunately not everyone was lucky enough to have that five star experience with him robert is now 78 and will perish behind bars because even if he manages somehow some way to weasel out of this life sentence he is currently serving he would immediately be extradited to utah where he got his second life sentence and he will start serving that one so mama ain't getting out of prison okay not now not ever for now he's at the menard or menard correctional center in chester illinois in case y'all want to see him a little bit of hate mail looking like Popeye the sailor man now how his eye done got smaller over the years is what i want to know and if your eye done got smaller too that's no shade we're not talking about you you my girl we're talking about him whose child I done got smaller, hair thin and neck loose. Several books have been published about him since he has been locked up. And look y'all, he gonna write this letter from his cell. Let me move over so I can put a photo. He gonna write this letter from his cell threatening the pseudo girls for using his likeness. Y'all want me to read it? Hold on. It says, do not use my name, my image, or any information about me at any time for any reason. If you use my name, my image, or any information about me whatsoever, I will sue you for 
for every penny you have signed robert ben rose girl he might try to sue me <laughs> <laughs> so yeah y'all if he tries to sue you girl i might start up a gofundme for my legal fees you know i'll let y'all know if a girl gets her a little piece of cease and desist or a letter that i'm being sued child i will cackle when i tell you i will laugh so hard from the depths of my soul y'all know i barely take anything serious i don't give a damn how to write him a letter i've really been it into like the darker top lip look lately mm. anywho that is it for today's video in the case please let me know your thoughts down below like the video it really helps the channel a lot i know i'm going through enough don't be like barrel girl like my video share the video subscribe to the channel if you have not as always i appreciate you so much for spending your precious time with me and i look forward to seeing you in the next one peace so today we'll be to, so to you know, I got a little piece of vitiligo on my forehead, so the struggles just continue to go on and on. Performing his military duties. Now, it, it, uh, Robert here is the person that spots them. Robert here, he pulls over into a haunt. I was about to say haunted. Not a, it wasn't haunted, girl. It's really haunted now. After getting rid of Regina, he, and when I say he, I mean, I got hair on my lip, girl. By the time the officer Miller, by the time he had pulled over and put those houses, uh, <clears throat> they find the keys to the cuffs on the uh. <sighs> My girl FaceTime me from Costa Rica. Hold on, girl. Hold on. Hey, girl. Hello. Are you recording? I'm I, I am. I don't even know what I was saying before my girl called. Uh, okay. He is booked for kidnapping. No, you're not. And as soon as the opportunity, opportunity. And so at that point, they were forced to release her, him. <gasps> Child, let me pop this Lexapro before I start malfunctioning on camera. Tastes like sanity. Bella girl has entered the chat. Hi, my precious girl. You're so beautiful. Piggy, piggy, you're so pretty. Piggy, piggy, you're so pretty. Okay, piggy. Y'all hear my baby crying? I can hear your heart <clears throat> crying out for me. Uh oh, I almost carried the note, girl. I need you to let me finish this. Blue, not you getting up and leaving. Don't do my girl like that. Don't do my girl.